In a previous video, I explained the ideas involved in the definition of integral. It's linked in the description. Watch it first if you have not done so yet, otherwise what follows won't make much sense. In this video, I will take those ideas and convert them into a formal, rigorous definition. Throughout the video, I will be looking at a function f, defined on an interval a, b, and I will assume the function is bounded, only bounded, I do not need it to be continuous or anything else. I want to be able to study the integral of many different types of functions. First, I will quickly summarize the ideas we learned in the previous video. Here is the graph of the function f. For now, I am picturing it as positive, and I want to define its integral to represent the area of the shaded region. To compute the area, our plan was first cut the region into slices. Then, underestimate the area of each slice by a rectangle below, in red in the picture, and overestimate it by a rectangle above, in green in the picture. This is an approximation that produces an error, but if instead of just a few slices, I take a lot of very thin slices, then it gets better and better. And I have to take some kind of limit or something in the end, I will soon be much more precise. All right, that's the idea. Now to formalize it. Step one, cut the region into slices. I will divide the interval into subintervals and then use those subintervals to cut the region into slices. Here's a new definition. A partition of the interval a, b is a set p that is finite, that is contained on the interval, and that contains both endpoints. In other words, p consists of the endpoints of the interval plus a few other points from the interval. For example, the set 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.9, and 1 is a partition of the interval 0, 1. It is not the only one. Here are three other partitions. How does this help me? Every partition gives me a way to split the interval into subintervals, and I can use those subintervals to cut the region into slices. I will use a convention to simplify notation. Every time I write a partition p as a set x0, x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, I am going to assume that the points are already in order. This is for simplicity. I do not want to have to write this every time. Great, now we have the language we need to describe how to cut the region into slices. For example, if this is the region whose area I want to compute, and I take this partition of the interval a, b, then I can cut the region into slices, four slices in this case. Let's move on to the second step. I want to under and overestimate the area of the region with rectangles. For example, with this partition, I have four slices, and I want to underestimate the area with these four rectangles. What is the area of the four rectangles? Let's start with the first one. I will denote the height of the first rectangle by m1. m1 is the infimum of the function f on the first subinterval, from x0 to x1. I may be tempted to say m1 is the minimum of the function, but remember that not every function has a minimum. On the other hand, the function f is guaranteed to have an infimum, whether it has a minimum or not. We are assuming f to be bounded, so it is bounded on every subinterval, so it has a supremum and an infimum on every subinterval. Great. So the area of the first rectangle is the height, m1, times the width, x sub 1 minus x sub 0. Now to the second rectangle. The height is now different, m sub 2, which is the infimum of f on the second subinterval, and the area is still height times width. In the same manner, I can add the area of the third rectangle and the fourth. It is convenient to rewrite this sum more compactly using sigma notation. The area of the red rectangles is the sum from i equals 1 to 4. In this case, it is 4. In general, the number of rectangles will vary. Of m sub i times x sub i minus x sub i minus 1. That was the area of the four red rectangles as an underestimation. You see that we can do the same thing with the four green rectangles as an overestimation. The only difference is that the height of each rectangle will be the supremum rather than the infimum of the function f on the corresponding subinterval. This leads us to a new definition. Given a bounded function f on an interval and a partition p of the interval, let's introduce some notation. On each subinterval, I am calling little m sub i the infimum of the function and big m sub i, the supremum of the function. And finally, it is customary to write delta x sub i for the width of the subinterval. With this notation, I define the p lower sum of f 
as this sum in the red box. And the p upper sum of f as this sum in the green box. These are just numbers, but it is important to remember their geometric meaning. They represent the under and over estimates for the area that comes from the red rectangles and the green rectangles. Great, we are ready for the final step, step three. This is the hard one. How do I define integral out of all of this? What I know so far is that the integral must be a number and it must be between all the lower sums and all the upper sums. Let's draw a picture. This is the real nine. I choose one partition and compute its lower sum, it is a number. Then I choose another partition and I get another lower sum, and another, and another, and so on, until I get all possible lower sums. Similarly, I could compute all possible upper sums. The way I drew this picture, I am making an implicit assumption that every lower sum is smaller than or equal to every upper sum. This makes sense geometrically, and it turns out to be true. But it is a bit subtle and it needs to be proven. I am calling it a lemma. I will postpone the proof till the next video. For now, let's see what I can do with this assumption. Let's focus on the lower sums. Out of all of them, how do I define the integral? Notice that every lower sum is an underestimate, but if I take beta partitions, the lower sums get bigger. Similarly, beta partitions will give me smaller upper sums. Then what? Beta partitions give me larger lower sums and the larger lower sums get closer and closer to the area I want to calculate. Or so it seems from the picture. This suggests I should take some kind of limit. But what limit exactly? The limit as the partitions approach something? Partitions are not numbers, so this is not a limit in the sense we are used to. There is a way to interpret this as a limit, and I will explain it in a later video. But there is also a simpler, more elegant solution. I am going to define two integrals, one from the lower sums and one from the upper sums. I define the lower integral of f from a to b, and I denote it with these symbols, i, a, b with a line under it of f, as the supremum of the lower sums of f. Each lower sum is a number, all the lower sums together form a set of numbers, and I take the supremum of that set. It may be tempting to think it is the maximum, the largest of all the lower sums, but beware, most of the time there isn't a maximum. There is a supremum, however. The set of lower sums is non-empty and bounded above. Can you justify why as an exercise? And therefore, it must have a supremum. Alternatively, I can use the upper sums. I define the upper integral of f from a to b, and I will write it using the same symbols, but with a line over instead of under it, as the infimum of all the upper sums. Now I have two definitions of integral. Which one do I choose? Since every lower sum is less than or equal to every upper sum, I can conclude that the lower integral is less than or equal to the upper integral. And now I have two cases. The good case is when they are equal. In that case, I say that f is integrable on AB, and I define the integral to be the common value. The bad case is when they are different. Then I say that f is non-integrable on AB, and the integral is undefined. You may wonder how these two numbers could possibly be different. I will give an example in a later video. Finally, there is one very important theorem. Every continuous function on the closed interval AB is integrable. In other words, this process is guaranteed to work for all continuous functions, and it always produces one single value for the integral. If the function is not continuous, then it may or may not be integrable. I'm not going to write a proof for this theorem. It is quite technical. You will likely learn the proof of it if you take an analysis course. Okay, I got to the definition. That was the goal. There is much more I would like to comment on, but this video is already long enough as it is, so I will stop here. Before finishing, here is my plan for the next videos. I need to prove the lemma I skipped. Doing that proof, I will make the meaning of better partitions more precise. I want to present examples of both integrable and non-integrable functions from the definition. I will explain an alternative way to understand integrals as limits. And finally, for some functions, there is yet a different way to interpret integrals using so-called Riemann sums. That is a lot. See you in the next video.